down Kingdom come as we fall to the ground And proclaim Heavenly Your spirit falls, cleanses, shakes us now Just saw a miracle, holy is the crown Oh my King This was meant to be pre-recorded, but I set it to the the uh, the setting where we are live. So welcome everyone to SOZ page. Uh, if I look like I've been in the woods all night, I have. But hey, you know this is real life, and we're going to talk about some real life and uh, the real sovereignty of God today. So I have uh, the honor of hanging out today with Benjamin Faircloth. Uh, he recently came and spoke at a Stones of Zion event and really brought an amazing word. Uh, we we all follow him. We <clears throat> we we love that ministry. We love the truth and the uh, non compromising uh, word he continues to bring, uh, along with with a lot of other watchmen of the hour and and prophets that are that are out today. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, invite Benjamin on and open in prayer and and maybe just we'll we'll discuss a little bit of how fun it was to freeze in Tennessee. And today we're going to talk about the sovereignty. Uh, of God's judgment and and how we should rejoice in that and instead of uh, try to resist his judgments because they're righteous uh, and whatever else the Holy Spirit may lead. So, uh, yeah, we're going to welcome Benjamin. Hey, Dalton, thank you so much for having me on. I'm honored to be with you guys. Yes, sir. Um, so we actually are live. I, I pushed the wrong button. I'm on Central Standard Time, so I scrambled over a pile of dirt to make it to the camper with the Wi-Fi. And, um, and we had to get this together real quick this morning. 
but um yeah um uh, i uh i'm honored to have you and and uh if we can open in prayer that would be really great absolutely holy one of israel bless your name yes. there is none like you you are marvelous you are wonderful you are the almighty one you are righteous in all of your ways and all of your thoughts and all of your deeds forever and i thank you that you have set forth many that are following you without compromise in this hour and i thank you for the inspiration that that it that it gives us to to fear you lord and we honor you and your majesty and your might and i thank you uh for what you're bringing together in this late hour in jesus name amen amen well so if we can touch on freezing in tennessee a little bit uh <laughs> How, how was that, Benjamin? Uh, it was cold, man, but it was awesome. I had a great time in the Lord. Uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 the sun started going down. The more it went down, the colder it got, you know. It did. And, and uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's the way it rolls. And uh, but the fire of God was there and the passion of the people was, was there and that's all that matters, man. But, uh, yeah, it was a great invite. I really appreciate it. And, uh, uh, you know, you guys were great, uh, hosts to, to Jennifer and I, and we were, uh, felt very welcomed and comfortable and, and, uh, all those, uh, good things, man. I appreciate hey, it. No problem. Yeah. I got a few shots. Uh, here's one we got, I'm going to send you these cause they turned out awesome. Oh, but, yeah, there's, awesome. Yeah. there's one, uh, there's one of you praying for someone that was present. Yeah. Um, there's, there's from, from that angle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I love this one. You're really in the moment praying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Catch <laughs> flies. Yes, sir. Yeah. We'll send them all to you, but it, it really, it really was an honor having you. And it, you know, it's always great to, to come together with those who have already kind of heard the message. So you, right. you, you're, you're preaching to the choir at that point, but at the same time, it's, it's the, the true gathering, I believe, that he's doing in this hour before uh, his return, um, because it does say one of my favorite scriptures is Isaiah 65. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's the famous millennial reign uh, discourse, you know, that as Isaiah makes. And right. right before it goes into the millennial reign part, uh, it chronologically lists the judgments, the same ones in revelations that are in the last days. But amidst those judgments, it says, I will give the mountains as an inheritance to the sons of Jacob. And it says, and it goes and it lists all the things that's going to be happening on the earth. It says, you know, while the earth is, is thirsty, I will, my people will drink water. You know, while the, while the earth is, while the earth is starving, I will feed my people. You know, while the earth is, is torn in, in war, my people will have peace. You know, and then it, right after that, you know, there's a judgment, uh, and then it goes and lists the millennial reign scriptures that we're, we're most of us are familiar with uh, about you know uh, the age of a tree being the age of a man, and and how we're going to live to see the the uh, the toils of our labors actually fulfilled, and no longer are we going to to uh, have sorrow. You know, uh, the lion will lay down, uh, or you know, with the uh, the, the wolf will lay down with the lamb and the, you know, all of the, the scriptures listed there. But right before that, it lists God's judgments and how he's going to preserve his people. And our ministry is really, um, you know, we're a prophetically guided ministry. We all, we have dreams and visions. We listen to the Lord. We hear the Lord. But we also uh, we also know that his only message isn't that we're all going to be destroyed. It's that it's that in the midst of this destruction we can lean on him and uh, whatever it may be, even if it may be in the face of death, he's going to walk with us in these last days. Yeah, absolutely. I believe there's going to be Goshen moments for sure in Goshen places. And, uh, you know, we just have to be led by the Holy Ghost and not be like Lot's wife and try to hold on to the things that we have. Uh, this is all temporal. Your 401k, your retirement, your stuff. Uh, none of that matters. And, you know, when the children of Israel were called to war by the trumpet, the shofar, they had 72 hours to get their stuff up and go. Uh, I don't think we can do it in 72 days. We have so much stuff as people and, and baggage. 
how much can you know would you let go to 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 get into that goshen place so uh yeah i i know god has has people uh, pockets of of uh, remnant that are going to be safe safe places uh they won't be uh uh totally uh uh kept from the you know sheltered from it all because it rains on the just and the unjust i mean if i'm going to pay 10 bucks for for gasoline i'm just throwing that out there so are you you know what i mean no matter where you are that's the way that reality is but uh my god will supply all of my needs according to the riches and glory so uh, uh, I may have a tank full of gas and never pull a, a dollar out of my pocket. I mean, I believe those type of miracles are coming for sure. Amen. Yeah. Uh, there's so many who have proclaimed, you know, exactly what you've said, you know, that, that are actually listening to the Lord. And, uh, you know, we're, we are speaking in one voice right now. Those who those who hear and those who obey. And uh, it's important to um gather in those who would listen i think we're in such a late time right now that it's it's like the last stragglers that that have uh not saying he he will bring a large harvest in in the process of his judgment that's something he's mm -hmm. revealed to myself and and many others that you know the guys the big tail evangelist preachers that say there's going to be a great revival and you know it's going to be the most glorious hour the world's ever mm -hmm. seen you know, the, the, the enemy mixes in truth and fiction. You know, these these guys are telling the truth, but they're wrapping it in, in a blanket of, of uh, Teletubbies and, and cotton candy. Okay. And um, what the Lord has shown me, and I, I believe shown other, other listeners that are hearing from the right place, uh, a non-biased place, a place where we want him to speak and us to repeat and not no, no in between. Um, he has said that this this revival will come, but it is in the midst of his judgments. And he's told me his judgments are necessary even for his people to come to their knees because they have departed from him. And and so it's in that judgment time in which we're forced to make a decision. And I think the Lord has has caused that each one of us are going to have a moment or even several moments of decision that we can either choose to walk with him or walk away and that's that's that sifting process and then that final that final point is when the, when the mark is instituted and we either choose the comforts of this world or we and and the, and the safety and security of our own lives or we choose to follow the lord and flee to the wilderness as revelation 12 states you know hopefully our place can be a place where his people can actually flee to the wilderness too we may even have to flee from there, but either way, either way, the, the Lord will definitely preserve his people. But we all have a testing. And what, like Benjamin said, I, I do believe the same. The, the, the judgment of the Lord falls on the just and the unjust. Even the blessings of the Lord falls on the just and the unjust because he is ultimately eternally fair. And so in his fairness, he lets us go through similar trials to see what we're made of because isn't that the course of life? Yeah, absolutely. You know, faith in our life is always tested. Faith is always tested in our lives so that we, number one, know where we are with God and we know the strength of our faith. It's like a rope. You don't just, you know, repel off the side of a mountain with any rope. You test that rope. It's tested. It says it on the package, you know, rated for so and so. And that's what our faith does. And, you know, speaking of judgment, judgment begins at the house of God. And this judgment that's coming on the earth is going to first be a cleansing of the church. He's going to suddenly come to his temple. There is so much that needs to be exposed. Uh, the Lord gave me a word recently that we're going to go from exposure to disposal. You're going to see men of God just gone off the face of the earth because of their uh misleading and their witchcraft and and these things and uh, their violation you know of covenant with god that's misleading people he cares more about the sheep than an individual in the sense that he deals with the individual and he loves us but he will he will sacrifice an individual in order to save the sheep and and so we need that we have a lot of people that are just being totally misled they're in the new age they're in the chrislam they're in all kinds of you know, wickedness and paganistic uh, 
practices in our churches, and I blame it squarely on the pastors. I'm not worried about the spirit of the age. I'm worried about the leadership of this day. That's my message, you know, and uh, I, I, I believe that we're going to see that, Dalton, it's, and it's going to be a very fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, and it's going to bring all back to us. Humility is coming back to the church big time. Amen. Yeah, it's the picture that's been painted of God. You know, I, I was raised Catholic, and, and obviously I think the Catholic Church is an apostate church, um, you know, and the Lord revealed those things. But there are definitely believers laced throughout every denomination that do love the Lord, including Catholicism. Now, once they start hearing the Lord, they, they're going to hear real quick, like, hey, there's there's some conflict here. Um, but But one thing the Catholic Church did impart to me was the reverence of God. Um, you know, I was, I was an altar boy when I was like nine and I am way far from Catholicism now. So no, nobody, nobody that's listening needs to think I'm, I'm against, you know, idols. I'm against praying to saints, all the above. Uh, but I'm, I'm giving credit where credit is due in the sense of there's kind of an ancient reverence that's preserved there that you don't necessarily see in a lot of, uh, evangelical Protestant churches. And so, you know, I, I do, I am thankful that the fear of the Lord and his majesty was kind of uh, placed from, from childhood there for me because I've always seen it that way. And whenever I went, you know, was led by the Lord into the Protestant church and then into non-denominational and then to assemblies of God. And now I'm just a follower of Christ because I think it's all, all the rel religiosity is bunk. But, um, you know, I did not see the fear of the Lord as a commonplace in these American churches at all. And um, I don't see the problem with it. I mean, he is the eternal God who, who literally formed everything by the word of his mouth and can destroy anything and everything in a second. And it says in Colossians that we have our existence in him. Everything is existing within him, within his grasp, you know, and, if if he's that big and that mighty i don't see the problem with just accepting that we're his subordinates and going from there yeah absolutely i mean we are we, we are his children but we're also his slaves and we're not only his slaves we're his friends i mean we're in the family of god and uh i i just look at it this way if you love god then show that you do love him you don't fornicate you don't look at pornography you don't uh, have addictions in your life you do everything you can to walk in holiness be you holy as i am holy for without holiness no man shall see god uh, not only will you not see god but pe people won't see god in you and so you know holiness is not what you wear holiness is who you are it's your character it's the way you act and it's towards your reverence uh towards god and we're missing that people come into the church and with disdain for for God and for the building itself, you know, they're there for the Tupperware party or for the hookup, or they're there for the business deal, or they're there for uh, the, the pastor's there for a career because he can't do anything else outside the church, you know, and these things like that. And, and, and God says, you will respect my house. You will respect me and, and who I am. And I, I believe we're so far from that in my experience over 30 years of ministry, you know, that's what I've seen. And it's it's a downward trend of disrespect towards God. And he's become our buddy. God's not my buddy. He's my father. He is my friend. Uh, he's my close confidant and those things. But at the end of the day, I kiss his feet. <laughs> at the end of the day, I bow down to him. Amen. And uh, we, we've made a God of our bellies in the church. Paul was very specific about that. And I believe that the American church is a baptized pagan church to the max. And uh, there's very few that walk in, you know, in holiness. Again, holiness being the pursuit of God and righteousness, you know, not being perfect. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But a heart is perfect towards God. And that's a big difference. Amen to that. You know, I... <clears throat> I spent uh, I spent years living a backslidden lifestyle, and and he knocked me down over and over, and he gave me chance after chance, and uh, you know through it he definitely taught me a lot of things about his grace, his mercy, 
but I'm telling you, he also showed me hellfire in those years. He, 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 he warned me. Um, and not only that, you know, the consequences of, of, of certain lifestyles or behaviors are terrible. Um, you know, out, out in the country music, rock and roll world of me singing on stages and doing all that stuff, you know, making life about me and what I want, my dreams. Um, the Lord wasn't happy with that, you know, yeah. and, and he, he, uh, luckily his graciousness allowed me to pick up where I left off. You know, I was called to do ministry a long time ago, but I'm telling you, it's, it's a fight. No one can win at the end of the day, whether it be in this life or after this life. So we might as well accept our, you know, accept our place before the Lord. And, and from there, that's the beginning of all wisdom. And, and from there, uh, he begins to give us, uh, you know, a spirit of excellence about things we do. He begins to open doors. He begins to, you know, lay out the path in front of us. He, he gives us he gives us more trials. But when we rejoice in those trials, uh, we, we end up getting through them faster. And we also end up taking something away from them faster. Um, and, and, you know, that that's part of God's judgment. You know, speaking of God's judgment, when people hear that word um, and I've prayed on this, I've sat in the Holy Spirit about this. People hear the word judgment and they automatically think the movie 2012, the whole world is just turning on its head and everybody's dying. You know, there's plenty of that coming by the end of it all. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's stages of that. But if you go to the book of Revelations, for those listening, the entire book says this bowl or this cup or all of these things are, or this trumpet's blown and these calamitous events happen. But it says, and they still would not repent. That's a key to the nature of God there. The entire book of Revelation and the entire tribulation that we're about to see, uh, that October 2nd was quite a marker. We'll see what comes from that. But, but I will say the entire unfolding of events we're about to see is with the purpose of God on the final harvest, one last time, giving everyone in their perspective place a chance to accept him. And so that that's what judgment is. Judgment is not just saying I'm going to destroy everything because I'm God and ha ha ha. Judgment is saying this person's done these deeds. What can I do to turn their course? And and he judges what that may be. And that that event or that consequence happens in your life with the intent of you turning to him. And that's that's what his judgment is there for. Um, and, and also it's to it's to pay back those who uh, otherwise would not be paid back, either good or evil. You know, God's judgment doesn't just include, I'm going to send a flood and wipe everything out. God's judgment also includes, these people have lived a righteous life. I'm going to provide and protect them. That's God's judgment too. So pe people forget about how righteous and how, how wonderful God's judgment is. You know, his judgment... Uh, saves the righteous and destroys the wicked. You know, there's so many Old Testament scriptures about the fate of the wicked and the fate of the righteous, and and that's all judgment. What what would you have to say about about that? Well, first of all, you know, judgment is the mercy of God. Judgment is the mercy of God. He yeah, he could destroy us in a second. I mean, it takes one em embolism. It takes one, you know, heart attack. It takes one, you know. Uh, one stroke of, of his, his finger or his thought, and man is gone. So he doesn't get no pleasure in that. He's not a child abuser. So he does have mercy. And then the other side of that judgment is justice. So you have this balance, you have mercy and you have justice. And he only he knows how to, to, to weigh it. And he's very fair in that balance. And, uh, you know, he's measured in everything he does. And so I look at the book of Revelation. I look at judgment in the same light. That it's not just doom and gloom. And I would warn those who follow those guys that all everything's negative and negative because I guarantee you they have a negative view of God. And, and there's more to him. He, he's a, a pris, prism of just amazing features that are beyond the comprehension of our mind. Because once you think you've captivated a thought about God, he'll just blow that thought out of your mind with something greater that he is. And that's, that's, that's the amazing part of who he is. So when you, when you look at the book of revelation, which by the way, the book of revelation is a book of depopulation. He really explains what he's going to do. 
and there is many people that will, will perish into eternity. But again, there is that final harvest. So there's that balance. And, and I have to recognize and realize as a child, I have to receive my correction. So there's the measurement of mercy. But, it, but if I'm not a child of God, I'm a bastard. And if I'm a bastard, then I'm going to receive the penalty of that from God. And that's the justice of God. So I think it's a beautiful balance. Everything in the word of God is balanced. But anytime you get somebody to an extreme, stay away from them because they're going to take you in the false doctrine or they're just going to lead you into the negativity of God, which is which is a truth. You know, you and I were talking about, and if you, were, you were speaking about it in the beginning where these guys will prophesy truth, but then they have, you know, falsity, if you will. They have, they have uh, lies mixed in there, but folks don't have enough discernment. Now I want to preach because most church folk don't read the Bible. They don't know the Holy Ghost. They don't spend time in prayer. So they can't discern truth from fiction, facts from lies. And so they hear just enough truth and they swallow it. It's like that bait that has poison in the middle of it. And uh, this this is why I believe God's going to really deal with the shepherds and the leaders. Uh, but that's an act of mercy, too. And, and, and the last thing I'll say on that concerning mercy and judgment is, is some people will go home early for to be spared what's coming. That's an act of mercy. Now, I'm, I'm not sovereign, so I don't understand that. And I don't know how God's going to do that and how he chooses that. But but in these coming days, there will be many that will depart and never have to face these things. And there's a reason for that. So Amen. thank God. Thank God for grace. <laughs> Amen. You know, it, that takes me back. Um, this past weekend, I spoke at a conference called Heaven is Real um, down in Texas with the the uh at the gallery the art gallery of the of the girl who's now a lady uh who drew the the painting of or painted the painting of jesus at eight years old you know mm -hmm. after having visions of him and it was featured on heaven is for real and um i when i had my experience at 21 where i it was like paul in the body or out of the body i don't know it was definitely not i was not here yeah. And I saw I saw the throne of the Lord. I saw paradise. And that's the Jesus that I saw. He looked a lot more Hebrew. He wasn't a white guy, you know, right, um, right. He had, he had messy hair and and uh, olive skin and 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 uh, stern but compassionate eyes. Very similar to the picture uh, she she painted. Um, but I was speaking there with some others about uh, about the reality of heaven and hell and the others who had been dead actually for up to an hour and 45 minutes on the table and, hmm. and had an NDE. It was really fun. But around that time in, in my life, um, I, I got a word from the Lord after I experienced that about his, his judgment that was coming on the earth. And the way he spoke on it to me was, was so, um, just he sees it so differently than we do he spoke of this earth like his like his garden like his vineyard of souls mm -hmm. and he was going to uh he knew that there was going to be good grapes and bad grapes before he ever planted them and he knew that you know his his goal is is to is to harvest good souls and bring them into eternal life and he brought up how life and death he doesn't see it the same he also brought he asked me a question. He said, um, you know, what do you think the term harvest means? You know, harvest is where you cut something down. So once again, all of these televangelists that are, you know, uh, speaking of this final harvest, they're, they're not given the whole story because the mm -hmm. harvest is where our lives are ended and we enter our eternal destination. So, you know, not all of us will, will perish through this time. You know, there is the millennial kingdom coming up. It says there will be more children born in that kingdom. So somebody has to survive to do that because there's an argument of if a resurrected person is going to continue to have children. Um, I, I'm, I lean more to that. If you survive through this, you're going to continue to populate. Um, but uh, in general, um, you know, I don't think the Lord sees life and death is the same way we do. I believe this is the this is the scheme or the um, or the. Uh, you know, elementary school, a training ground, a proving ground that he made. And, and, and we are truly his treasure. He's, 
He's working for us every day of our lives, trying to cultivate us, trying to grow us into a fruit that's that's meat for eternal life. And Jesus spoke of it the same way. He said, he said that every tree which does not bring forth good fruit will be hewn down and cast into the fire. And, you know, that kind of turns once saved, always saved on its head. You know, um, you know, we, we're, we're all planted and we, we get to choose what we do. And I just think eternal life is such a wonderful thing. And it's not like we strive for that in our own works, but we, we should strive for the best. We should strive to be when we when we meet our last day. We want to be made of such great substance before the Lord that he that that we're just ready to take on eternal life because we're going to take on our character. The Lord says that everything that's in us and written the book of Revelation that is not um, made of of the stuff of righteousness will be his judgment will burn all of us, including the righteous. And the only thing that that will be left, you know, is not the stubble, but what is pure. And so I, I just hope that we can all strive to be, um, we can strive to be pure and powerful and righteous and all the things that the Lord is. And those are titles. Those are, those are things he wants to impart to us from his own nature um, eternally, which is really cool. But it's hard to get that eternal perspective if you're stuck in the things of this world every day. It truly is. Yeah, and if you resist the correction of God and the discipleship, and that's what we are, we're disciples. What are disciples or disciplined followers of Christ? And you you know, you have two fires. You have the fiery trials of life that prepare you for the eternal fires of your judgment, you know, what you've done. So uh, your your life is basically, you know, by by fire. I mean, it, it's a it's a fire baptism. And 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 we should expect to go through those things. And God is always testing, like you said, cultivating us and and growing us and in john chapter 15 you know he's fruit more fruit much fruit he always wants to see us abounding he's he's not a god of suppression he's a god of prosperity and blessings and he wants to see you fruitful multiply do all those things that commandment to adam didn't stop at, at the high treason of sin that commandment has passed on to this very moment to you to me to everybody listening be fruitful multiply um, not only in this earth, but in, in the in the kingdom to come, because he wants us to. We're, we're working, yes, to survive and to succeed on this plane, but we're actually preparing. We're, we're in an interview. <laughs> you know, we're at a training ground for eternity because who we are now is what will be then. Uh, we'll be known as we are. But as far as all that we've done and all that, that God has put in us, I mean, it, it's going to be in heaven is just going to be an amazing uh, experience for us beyond our comprehensions. I don't think any anybody can describe it enough. Um, but the reality is he is preparing us for eternity and, and let God do his work. Let patient have its patience have its perfect work. Don't resist God. You know, somebody's listening right now needs to know that God's working on you. He is pruning you, according to John 15. Let him do it. Get on the table. Let him do the surgery. Let him get it out of you. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to be much better after. Amen. Yeah, I mean, we go through the scripture and the Lord likes the bold and he likes the Lord has likes and dislikes. If you read that in scripture, it's all through there. You know, he. He hated Esau, you know, um, it's, it, it's the, he, he, John, the beloved, you know, uh, Christ's very own closest apostle, you know, although he loved them all the same, there was something special, the, a friendship there. God favors some and he disfavors others. And that is based on our worthiness. It's based on our deeds. It's based on the thoughts and intents of our hearts and, and really, all of that is based on our humility because the Lord can change, can change any of us. You know, he can, he can sanctify and change us into a new creation because of this wonderful new covenant. So there's really no excuse anyone has to be a schlob or to be a, an angry, hateful, bitter person. You know, the Lord actually has offered free, free uh, healing from that uh, in, in his sacrifice. But, the Lord looks down on us and he he likes those people who are willing to take a warrior mentality and say, 
God, cut me open. I'm right here. Take me, do it, make it quick if you can, but just go ahead and get it done because I want to walk with you. You know, if you have that attitude, that will move his hand in your life so fast because he liked he liked Jacob's willingness to wrestle him all night. You know, he was in, you know, through the angel of the Lord, the apparition of, of God, um, you know, he wrestled with Jacob. And I promise you, he didn't wrestle because he, he, he was going to possibly lose. He wrestled because he enjoyed it. Okay. God didn't have to wrestle with Jacob. He could strike him down or take the breath out of his lungs. He did it because he likes us. Mm -hmm. So we should also remember that. Have a heart of boldness and courage and just see what kind of fruit that produces with your walk with the Lord because it'll challenge him to say, all right, well, I'm going to do what this man said and then see what he does next. You know, it. the Lord enjoys this walk with us too. So we, we must remember that. You know, the Bible specifically says that he is a warrior. He's a God of war. And uh, you look at King David, the warrior king, you know, he noticed that he didn't pick some soft, sissified, Fibonacci type of man to be a king. He picked a warrior who had so much blood on his hands, he couldn't even finish the, the assignment for God. And, and David, man, had a heart after God. And, and notice that favor is not fair, but because of David's commitment, he got favor. Uh, something was an amazing thing. When, when David had you, uh, uh, Bathsheba's husband uh, killed, uh, murdered, you, uh, you know, he found something that no other Old Testament person found that was grace. He literally reached into the dispensation of grace, uh, which I'm not a dispensationalist, but I'm using it as an epoch, you know, a period of time. He reached into something, let's put it this way. He reached into uh, Calvary, you know, the, the grace from Calvary, and he received redemption because he should have been killed uh, for for uh, for. Uh, for not only murder, but for uh, adultery, no matter your king or not, that was the law. And he found grace. Of course, he paid for it. The sword never left his house. But David, again, he was such a warrior that that, that caught God's attention. And out of that lineage comes, you know, the king of all kings, you know, from the house of David. And, and we know Yeshua, Jesus. And it's an amazing thing. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, David understood the, the, the grace of God. He also stood, so understood the mercy of God. But check this out. He was he was going to be uh, caught up by the Philistines. And he said, Lord, I'd rather fall into your hands than to fall into their hands. Because he knew God would be merciful to him. So, man, there's so much to unpack there. But uh, let God just do his work. He will be merciful. If you don't, the opposite is the enemy, and the enemy will kill, steal, and destroy from you. But God's going to heal you. It's going to hurt, <laughs> you know, the surgery and, and the repairs. But, uh, you know, that I'd rather have God cut up on me than some blind surgeon. Amen. Wow. You you, you, you unpacked a, a, big, a big can of amazing the, theological uh, beans there. Um, I completely agree with what you said i'm not a dispensationalist either and obviously we don't have to go into into that mm -hmm. tit for tat but i know you and me would tear them apart if we mm -hmm. if we pulled out the scripture um mm -hmm. but um besides that um by revelation of the holy spirit and by the studying of scripture um i know that the verse he was slain before the foundation of the world um, and even the verses that refer to him as the firstborn of many brethren, the word there in the Greek is not the same as English, as in Jesus Christ was not born, so to say. He's not a finite created being. The word there in the Greek is preeminent one. He was preeminent before all creation. Um, so um, you go into that, then you combine that with, you know, um, he was slain before the foundation of the world. And then you go start researching the Old Testament very clearly. You see that the whole thing is about Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is God. And that that's the man that they were seeing, Ezekiel, uh, Moses, all of them. Uh, now, 
he has different forms, his glorified form. And then he has his form he took when he was here, which is in the similitude of his glorified form. Um, but I will say that um, Abraham was the first Christian. It, it, time didn't matter to God because Abraham, by faith, believed in the one true God. And through his belief, God began revealing himself to Abraham uh, to the point of speaking face to face, um, you know, and re receiving these revelations about the coming Messiah. So that kind of faith is the same faith that grafts us in. And the reason why Abraham was considered righteous by faith before Christ came is because that covenant has been available from before time. It's, it's the same covenant that all the prophets walked in, the ones that actually beheld God. They were walking in, in the Christian salvation before Christian salvation came in time. That existed for everyone in all time. That's a deep, that's a deep rabbit hole to go down, but God's eternal. So our, our time is, is not dispensationalized by him. And, uh, you know, men try to explain these things because of their lack of eternal perspective. But when we pray and when we when we see who the prophets were speaking of, the great I am has indeed walked among us. That's all I've got to say. He truly has. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they beheld his glory and they beheld his glory in different forms and fashion. Uh, there, there's a great book and I don't recommend books very often. But when I was in, uh, in, in somebody can vet if they like to. But I was in Bible college. I read this book called The Scarlet Thread. And it took the whole blood, the whole understanding of Christ from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, that scarlet thread. And it's the truth. He's in every book of the Bible. If you look for him there in types and shadows and an actual figure. And so Jesus in Christianity is not a second thought. It wasn't God's plan B. It was always the plan of God for Christ Jesus to come to the earth and do what he did. Uh, man doesn't know how to to articulate that, so he uses a Western terminology of Christianity. But it's always been Christ on and Christ in his people from the beginning. Like you said about Abraham, you know, everything he did symbolically with Isaac and, and on and on and on it goes, all points to Christ. I do a teaching on the tabernacle, and I'm going to tell you, every piece, every furniture, every tassel every curtain everything in there represents christ it's an amazing teaching if you've never heard it before or experienced it or studied it and, and so you know in christianity we act like especially gentiles we think we've discovered jesus you know we discovered christianity we we uh trademarked christianity uh not so it was from the beginning we're just engrafted into it and we ought to be of the most humble you know uh humble attitude to be a part of that great heritage of god and then look at the bible in a different way and say you know what because this is how i do it dalton for me abraham you know was it's the father of faith but he's also a family member you know moses is my brother uh, I'm part of that lineage because now I am a child of God, you know, I'm a child of the kingdom. So when you look at it that way, man, the Bible opens up, you know, so many different dimensions because now I belong. You get what I'm saying? I'm not this Westerner Gentile that's trying to understand. No, that's my lineage. That's my heritage uh, because that's what true adoption is. When he says you are adopted, there's no lines of of uh you know of of engraftment there's nothing it's so it's so perfectly blended by the blood it's as though you were born at that time or born into to the kingdom which that's what it is we look at adoption as you know a legal process and you follow the family tree of two family tree now uh that isn't how this works so man it's, you're gonna get me pumped up because i'm excited about my heritage because I am not just some, you know, American Christian. I am a believer of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of him. Though I wasn't there with them, his spirit was. And that spirit's in me, the ancient of days. Mm. Come on, somebody. Amen.
that's that's the best spirit to have brother there is no other spirit i want any part in and i'll tell you what we drive out a lot of other spirits and and when we do people's lives change because when you get that spirit of the lord inside of you indwelling in you called the baptism of the holy spirit your life forever changes and and you're still going to struggle you're still going to slip but every single time you're going to hate that sin more and more until you stop because the lord changes you Sometimes it happens all at once and sometimes it's a process, but you got to get his spirit inside of you and see what happens. Um, and you know, you were talking, you're talking on a lot of great things. Um, a minute ago, we're, we're touching on some awesome stuff today. Our identity in Christ is, is the most powerful thing to, uh, to know. And, and once we realize that identity, we actually can begin to hear God's voice more clear because it says we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. It says, as he is, so we are in this world. Uh, there, there's a part of us that's been changed into his likeness when we're truly born again and filled with the Holy Spirit because it's him inside of us. And so there's a great mystery there, a great a great uh, dance that happens uh, between his spirit and the sanctification of the self after that. And when we when we start surrendering to that work, what we no notice is not only that we can do his works as in miracles. We can we can do what he did um, in his name with his power that comes from within. But he also um, he also begins to. How do I say it? Well, it's different for everyone. He, his voice begins to shine through so much clearer. There's so many people who are like, I can't hear God or I can't. I can't, um, you know, connect with God. I feel like there's a wall there and I guarantee you there's a wall there. It's, it's yourself. That's why we need the baptism of the Holy spirit. But to hear his voice is, is to silence the self. And it is to, is to let him come in that still small voice. And you can't do that if you don't know your identity, because if you realize that he's living in you and you've been grafted in, like Benjamin's saying here, you begin to have that connection with him. And that's the most precious thing you can carry through your entire life. And it grows and it gets clearer and it gets stronger. And 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 he begins to reveal even secret things to us. Um, not secret like you've got the secret knowledge no one else has, but stuff that no one else naturally knows. He, he, he will show us these things about ourselves, about others, about the world. I just want to encourage anybody who's listening who says, well, I can't hear God. You know, what's wrong with me? I would just start by admitting, uh, number one, that there is something wrong with you. There's something wrong with me. You know, that's a good way to go before the Lord is say, I'm a filthy rag. That's humility right there. But once we get there, we just say, Lord, let me die and let you live in me. And that sort of thing, you know, causes the process to to be very much faster when we enter in through that, that kind of door of humility. And he begins to speak to us. So if anybody here is listening that that wants to hear God clear, start with your identity in Christ. And, you know, good books for that are, are Romans. You know, the book of Romans is really one of the best books for that. Um, but it's powerful, truly powerful to know your identity in the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, identity produces authority, which produces boldness. Because if you know who you are, you know what you have, you know your access, you know that you could boldly come into the throne of God, not gimme, gimme, my name is Jimmy, but I understand that, you know, I'm a child of the living God, I'm an heir, a joint heir with Christ, just Romans, like you said, Romans 8, you know, I know who I am, and therefore I know what I can have. If you don't know who you are, you don't know what you can have, and therefore you live a limited life. But he wants us to live a limited life. He wants us to, to live in the expansion of heaven, which is no lack, no slack. There's no, uh, you know, uh, lack of anything. And so when I understand who I am and I understand who he is in me, that authority comes. And that's why you say come out when you speak to a devil or demonic powers, because you know who you are and the Christ you speak of and his authority and what he did on the cross of Calvary. But if you don't know who you are in him, you're powerless. And, and that's not what God wants for you and I. So I agree with you on that. 
And, and I would say this, and this is just for me and my training grounds, beginning when I started learning to hear from God, I really struggled. I wanted to hear his voice. First of all, I had to get sin out of the way. I had to get obedience back into my life. And then I began to ask God to speak to me through his scripture. And that is to me the greatest foundation because uh, he'll start talking to you and all of a sudden he'll give you a scripture and you read it and you go, oh, wow, man, I heard from God. You know, that, and that's exactly the scripture I needed today. Not pulling out the little uh, fortune cookie scriptures out of your, uh, you know, thing you have on your desk that people use. I always call that uh, fortune cookie scriptures. I mean, it's ridiculous to me, but whatever. Uh, you pull it out and you say, oh, God speaking to me about this today. You know, OK, maybe so. I call that chance, but I don't yeah. believe in that. So anyways, you know, getting on your face and saying, God, speak to me through your word. And he'll give you a scripture, man. And then you go, oh, wow, that's his word. And then that word is his actual voice. It's the rhema of God. And then you start to learn that voice by learning his word. And then when you are away from the word and you're in prayer, you start hearing it and you'll be like, that's the voice of my shepherd. I know his voice. Does that make sense? And the word confirms what you're hearing. Yep. You don't get no special revelation beyond the word. If you do, you know, you ate too much pizza. It will, <laughs> always, <laughs> it will always confirm the word, brother. And people yep. say, I have a word for you. I'd be like, well, guess what? I just got done talking to God. So whatever you tell me is going to line up what he's already told me. And if it doesn't, then it wasn't God. And I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yep. Shake, yeah. shake, your hand, <laughs> shake your hand and, and hug your neck. But uh, And I won't castigate somebody who's trying. But, it, you know, if you're, yeah. So anyways, we'll get into another message there. But yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, well, there's 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 people who have the prophetic gifting uh, and who who naturally have a better a better set of ears in the spirit or have those giftings and callings. Um, but, you know, I, I'm one of those people. And when I was younger, uh, it was overwhelming because I could sit next to somebody and just know what they what they what happened to them 10 years ago or or all these things would pop in and I still have those gifts, but now it's more at my command. When I was younger, it was just, what did you give me, God? You know, this, this prophetic package. But what, what I was told at that age by some elders who were counseling me, who recognized those gifts was, was, uh, Hey, you need to continue in your basic Bible. You need to continue in the foundations. And, and back then I was like, well, you know, uh, I, I was, I was full of pride back then. I was, I really was as a young man. I was like, well, well, you can't, you can't see, see all these things, you know, and, and how, who are you to tell me? And little did I know that was the best advice that anyone could give me because, um, there are many other spirits out there. And, and if you're called to the prophetic, you do not need to shun the prophetic. Pa Paul said, don't do that. And Paul also said, passionately pursue all spiritual gifts, especially that of prophecy, which is the, the, the best gift to have. But at the same time, um, if we do not have a foundation in the character of God as revealed by our forefathers, you, you know, the word scripture, scripture, you know, sounds rigid, but they're really our forefathers. If you want to see it correctly, you know, um, these are our, our elder brothers, our friends, our forefathers, the pioneers, the, those who have a right to speak. And, and we should learn from them and, and learn the character of God through his very living word. Once we do that, like Benjamin said, it, it infuses within our very character, our nature. And, and we begin to be able to decipher, you know, that word is not from the Lord. You're, you're following a different spirit. And that discerning process of discerning spirits is something that's learned over time. You have to practice that. You don't just come out of the can and and know every spirit you're dealing with because you haven't experienced them yet there are some tricky ones out there so it's it's important as benjamin said stay rooted on the principles of the faith and the word of god and also there's a lot of people who give these a uh, couple paragraph long words mm -hmm. i've given a few of those and i've received about four of them in my life right. every one that i've ever written down sounds like something out of the book of Jeremiah or sounds like something out of the book of Ezekiel or Isaiah, you know, it's, it's very intense and the, and the, and God's, God's uh, sovereignty comes through. 
but we see like on uh you know like things like elijah list you know uh there's there's a horrible mixture of the prophetic there and a lot of these couple paragraph long words are just full of cotton candy promises and everything's going to be great and and it's just you can almost hear him talking with a lisp in these words you know <laughs> if if the words that are being written don't sound like the same vernacular that he's already spoken with for thousands of years you know i would encourage you to either throw it out or or if it's somebody close to you tell the person they need to mature before they release these things because it needs to sound like the same god that was speaking from day one because it is the same god if you're hearing him and i can tell you he never sounded to me any different at least from my experience than he always has sounded he he talks to me in parables he asks me questions he he sounds like a wise very wise king uh he sounds like a father he does sound very comforting and encouraging sometimes but i'll tell you He's more busy being God than just being patting me on the back all the time. I know that much. Yeah, no doubt. Well, when he called me to preach, he called me audibly. And that voice has never left my my spirit. And, uh, you know, it, it, it left an indelible mark in me that, uh, you know, I can hear his voice. Uh, I don't always have it as accurate, you know, like anybody. There's always cloudy days for signals. Everybody has a cloudy day. And you have to discern that. And that's where you have to go back to the word. There's times I'll just do like a little word season, man, and just hear the word of God, take my little Bible recorder thing, you know, and just listen to the word of God and shut my mouth to get that back, you know, refreshed in my heart and uh, get familiar with his, his voice. Even though it's some other guy talking, it's his words, man. It's life. And uh, and I think the church needs to get back to that Bible basic for sure and, and get in that relationship with God, because you, you hit it on the head. And I've preached it so many times. Uh, we, you know, we're lacking discernment in the church of God. People just they don't discern. They look at the guy. OK, he's he's handsome. He's suave. He he speaks well. He doesn't trip over his voice over his words i mean the guy has perfect tone perfect pitch he was taught how to preach which it is a gift you can learn it and uh all these different things and and they buy into it all along he's a charlatan he's a warlock he's a he's a homosexual he's a fornicator he's a pornographer he's you know all these things but they can't discern it because they're looking at that picture and they don't know the voice of the shepherd so uh, that's absolutely the truth. And discernment can only come through the sharpening of the word of God in your heart. It's a, it's a sword, two-edged sword. And you have to just whoosh, whoosh, spend time in that word and you'll get sharper and you'll get sharper. And as soon as that person opens their mouth, you're like, you're a phony. You know, you're a liar and uh, you're of the father, you're the devil. And, and you know, like Jesus is calling well, that book came out. Everybody has gone crazy over it. And actually, it was the second publishing because it flopped the first time and it got some traction. And, and if you read that stuff, that's not even the voice of the father. It's that's, not. Those prophecies are, are junk. But people are like, oh, God, oh, listen to how God is. And, you know, and you're right. I love that analogy. Going back to hearing his voice when I was called, you know. He doesn't change his his tune and tone. Does that make sense? I mean, he's who he is, man. He is the great I am. I change not. So he doesn't all of a sudden get softy. In other words, yeah, he talks and whispers, and yes, he does do do those things. But he doesn't he doesn't change his 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 demeanor uh, just to fit culture or to fit you in a prophecy. He is God Almighty. And, and he's going to talk the way he talks, and you better listen the way you're supposed to listen. I mean, so it's a good point. Yeah, the first time I heard it audibly, and, and that's only been a few times, you know, his word comes to me from my inner spirit, man, from right here in the center of my chest, not my mind. Right. It comes from right here in my heart, and it's like projects into my mind because that's where he lives, inside of inside of our hearts, inside sure. of our middle of the chest, you know, seed of the, seed of the soul um he lives inside of us but um and he we are his temple um 
but when I first heard him, it was actually concerning the rapture because I was, I was 20. I was apprenticing in a church, uh, uh, under a pastor. I was leading worship there as a singer. And, um, you know, there was good miracles, you know, of healing and, and, and deliverance happening in this church. And it was really awesome. But he's, he preached a three week series on the rapture. And I had read all Tim LaHaye. I had had a few visions at that point, including of the rapture. But in my vision, the sky was dark and we were in the mountains having to survive because the, the world had been war torn. And then lightning struck and we were we were up off the mountain. You know, we were gone from there and and that matches Matthew 24. So, you know, I, I I was obsessed with Left Behind after I had that at 14. I had that. It was a real vision. My first ever, actually. And so I got obsessed with Left Behind. But this preacher at night 1920 was preaching a three week series on the rapture. And I went home one day and I heard the voice. It was loud. It was audible and it was bold and mighty and strong. And it was it was the father's voice and he said and he was not happy he said there is no rapture such as these men suppose and i was just like um you know is this you god like i'm trembling i'm you know cold sweats it was it i like what you just said and did you say in indulable mark indelible yeah indulable mark yeah. that's that's very i've never heard it described that way but that's exactly what it did to me it's been kind of an anchor for me because he didn't ask for apologies and he didn't ask for my opinions. Mm -hmm. He just said what he said and he didn't say anything else. He just said what he was going to say. Then he gave me a word to that pastor at 20 uh, to say that for every person who starves, that you're leading astray in your congregation, every single mom that doesn't have food in their pantry when the, when the whole thing comes crashing down because of your sed seduction, because of this false doctrine that you are preaching, the Lord will hold their starvations on your head mm -hmm. and you will go into captivity because you're leading my people into starvation and captivity. Mm -hmm. And that's the word he gave me for that pastor. And at 20 years old, I delivered it because the Lord asked me to, and it was a great training experience, but I got kicked out of the church and called a false prophet immediately. Immediately. You know? <laughs> immediately. There was no questions asked, um, you know, it was hard for me to go through. It was very painful, but it started a long training experience, you know, of which I'm grateful for at this point. Um, you know, uh, so I, I agree with you, Benjamin. And speaking of that, you know, I, I know we're, we've been on for a little while. If we can take this subject and just kind of, uh, for, for our closing conversation, talk about, um, you know, we talk about the sovereignty of his voice, you know, about how he is, who he said he was, who, who he will be, who, who he's been forever. Um, he doesn't make apologies. Let's tie that back into the times we're in and just, you know, I know, uh, a lot of our listeners on my channel and your channel already, you know, agree with the times we're in, but if we can speak to the, the juncture we're at right now in this nation and what that looks like and how his judgments are going to be without apology. Cause I, I think we, we are on the same page there what the Lord has told me is there's no praying this away, you know, that the, the, he will, the Lord will get his blood for all the blood that's been shed. Let's put it that way. He's fair. There's been all these babies killed. Yahweh Elohim is going to get whatever fill is needed to fill that justice. And that's what I've been shown. And that, that gavel has already fallen. The angels in the council of God have already decided with God, that this is going to be no matter what we sit here and pray in our evangelical churches, heaven has decided. So maybe we go into his sovereign judgments and maybe what we can do in, in the process. Yeah. I think the first of all, we have to recognize and realize we're at the point of no return prophetically. You can't erase prophecy. Prophecy is, is, is the future uh, that's already happened. It's historic, but it's, it's, it's future for us and in god's mind it's settled his word is forever settled in heaven the counsel of god has already been determined as you said the judgment has already been laid out the verdict has already been read guilty man is guilty and he has to have that 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 punishment and that judgment and it's coming and it can't be reversed no matter how much pleading we do no matter what we do 
uh, we can't stop this. So that's the first thing. Once you embrace that realization that you're the point of no return and he's sovereign, then you have to not only embrace, but you have to brace yourself for what's coming because he's going to shake. He is going to shake the earth. He's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And, and there's nothing, again, I can do. He's sovereign. So I, I have to recognize that. And once I satisfy my my conscience and my heart and put my face like flint, I recognize and realize I'm going to have to go into tribulation. I'm going to have to go into the, the times that are undescribable. I preached and taught the book of Revelation for a year and a half, line upon line, every single word. We broke it down. And, and I still could not articulate what's coming. It's impossible. How do you? Uh, Hollywood can't do it. It's going to be beyond. Our, it, it's going to penetrate the soul of man, the judgment that's coming. It will be in the all of God. And, and no man can describe that because no man has seen this. Uh, look at what happened to John, man. He about passed out. You know, uh, he was so frightened by what he saw. He couldn't even describe it. So that that's coming. And so all, all, also, you know, the point of no return is 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 to recognize that God has complete dominion over the earth and he's going to do what he's going to do. And uh, America's mystery Babylon. We are Babylon. We're the daughter of Babylon. We're all the Babylon you want to describe <laughs> us and we will be judged in that day. And brother, when it comes down, you're talking about a hammer. And, and there's no negotiation. You know, George Bush used to say, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Well, neither does God, you know. <laughs> and uh, oh, gosh. we've been terrorizing children. America's number one in sex traffic in the world. It's the number one industry. Uh, our government's involved. Our pastors are involved. I mean, we just opened up another can here. But the reality is we deserve the judgment. The cup of fury is full, it's overflowing, and it's coming like a train. And there ain't a thing we can do except prepare and, and say, Lord, you're sovereign. Do what you need to do. I'm with you all the way. Wow. Amen. You know, you say cup of judgment. It's exactly what he told me. I was 20, 22 years old, and I had a vision of the coming destruction of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was first outside of New York City in the air. And a lot of times in these experiences, I'll I'll be picked up by an angel by the scruff of my neck like a cat. And he'll pull me up in the air above the earth and yeah. he'll fly me somewhere and then he'll drop me in a city. You know, and so this was one of those where at first I'm being carried. But then I saw I saw Jesus in this golden battle armor with an, with a lion on it. it he looked awesome. And he yeah. had that messy Hebrew hair, you know, and like wool, hair like mm -hmm. wool. Um, but he looked at me sternly and, and he said, go into the city and I will sh show you what is to come upon your land. So this angel picks me up again, takes me to New York City, lets me go, drops me into New York City. And I'm in the streets and everybody's shopping. Everybody's, you know, happy and you know, smiles plastered on their faces, just going about their business. Um, and, uh, I see a, I see a couple with down syndrome that, that a married couple that had both of them had down syndrome and they mm -hmm. gave each other a hug and a kiss and I could see the innocence there and the beauty there. And then I saw on the, on the street, uh, I knew some bad things were coming. So I was very sad because all these people were just completely oblivious. And then I saw God's love in those, those two people that, that were, you know, under, underrepresented. And I, I sat down on a bench and there was a lady next to me with with gray hair and she looked at me and I said, it's time, isn't isn't it? And she said, yes, it's time. And then, uh, you know, the the explosion went off and the city was was brought to ruin, um, hmm. completely brought to ruin, uh, utterly brought to ruin. And uh, then I was lifted up in the sky above the earth again. And I saw a man that was olive skinned, handsome with a red aura around him with his hand up like Hitler and all of the armies of the earth marching against each other. And, uh, and this was after the destruction of New York. A lot of people argue on the timing of the destruction of Babylon, which is clearly written in revelation. And yes, I do agree with you 
Benjamin, that America is Babylon. There's no other place, sorry, that sits upon many waters. It's not the Vatican. It's not any of these places. It's America. It's the same spirit. It, we're the same melting pot that Babylon used to be. It's the same thing replayed in our modern times. So, you know, I also respect those men who have gone before me. And if you want to, you know, put the general patches on any prophet, there's a man named Dimitri Dudeman that wears the general patches in heaven because no one I know, and I, I believe in prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. You know, um, I'm serving in an apostolic role at our church. I'm building a church. I'm building networks. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm casting out demons. I'm doing those works. I've had an experience where I've seen the Lord. You know, that's more of an apostolic calling at this point. But, but we have to look to those who have earned their stripes before us, you know. Uh, Dimitri Dudeman was electrocuted on the electric chair for his faith and survived. And the angel Gabriel told him that he was going to survive after all this torture, after smuggling hundreds of thousands of Bibles in Soviet Russia. And, you know, the general that pushed the red button the third or fourth time he was tortured um, died immediately on the spot. And the, the, they sent him over to America because they feared his God. And the angel Gabriel gave him a revelation that America was Babylon and that it would be destroyed. China and Russia would invade. There have been many prophets who have seen those things since Dimitri. But if you want to, if you wanted to qualify who's more, who's more of a prophet or less of a prophet, it's somebody who suffered for the faith. And that's a marking of somebody who uh, is a true prophet is, are they willing to suffer for the faith? There's so many TV prophets and, you know, like Benjamin was saying, suave prophets out there. And, and there's a mixture there. Some of what they're saying is true. Some of it's false. Some of it's them repeating other people, but none of it is the whole truth. If you evaluate their entire message, it's not the whole counsel of God. There are a few out there, but if we look into the past, there have been several and Dimitri Dudeman's one. And I believe that he was a true prophet. I believe that the angel Gabriel did tell him America was Babylon, no matter what Perry Stone says, because Perry Stone says America is not Babylon. And, you know, even Joel Richardson, who I look up to greatly. I love Joel Richardson, one of the best teachers that exists right now. I think he's in error about that. He thinks Babylon's going to be rebuilt in the Middle East. It's, it's very clear that we're Babylon. And, and also a simple uh, three day fast and a couple of, you know, prayers saying, Lord, are we Babylon? That'll solve the issue for any Holy Spirit filled believer because you'll hear a resounding yes. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, but my, yeah. my point is that I believe that in the time frame we're in, I, I think uh, the book of Revelation clearly states that Babylon is destroyed by the Antichrist, uh, you know, Eastern power axis. You know, Babylon is the Western power axis currently headed off out of New York City out of London and a little bit out of the Vatican. So we're, we're talking about the UN. We got these BRICS nations rising right now in the East, representing over a third of the, the world population. Uh, the Assyrian is what Isaiah calls the Antichrist. He's not a white guy and he won't be a white guy. Um, I believe that America has to decrease before the Antichrist can increase. And that's why I believe the Lord showed me the destruction of New York City before the Antichrist fully takes his seat. I believe the Antichrist and a nation that actually, at least in word and in constitution represents freedom cannot in, exist on the same on the same plane. This town ain't big enough for the two of us as us Texas boys would say. I believe that the Antichrist uh, and his aligned nations, uh, or at least just the nations that are aligned with that power axis will utterly obliterate the Western power to where the Western power is not even a single player on any sort of world field anymore. There will be a remnant that survives, but it will not be a player. That's why it's not listed in the armies in Ezekiel. That's why it's not listed in Revelation, except for when it's talking about it being destroyed. That's my opinion on the matter that's informed by 
scripture and what the Lord has shown me. But um, how do you feel about that uh, assessment? Oh, it's absolutely on the money. I mean, that's that's how it reads. Uh, you know, even if you just took scripture out of there and used the practical thoughts of a world without America, what would happen? You know, we'd have Nazism, we'd have communism, we'd have Marxism, we'd have uh, all of this just rampantly across the world. So America has been that uh, gap stop or whatever, you know, even that 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 uh, that blockage for the world, uh, even though we've created such evil ourselves, is just in the point of uh, darkness has not been able to overtake completely the earth, meaning the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the Antichrist, because America is there. And that's why America has to be removed. So if you just did it logically and you took away the greatest firepower ever, ever created on the earth, which was America and its military, what would our enemies do? I mean, they're, they're growing. China is a dragon. What a dragon it is. And when it unleashes its power and hypersonic missiles and things that we don't even have in Russia, and, and, you know, so, yeah, it's point on. That's what's going to happen. That's our future. And again, that's a part of embracing and the part of preparing for impact. And uh, as believers, there's no fear. You know, we learn to be content. Like Paul said, you're going to lose luxury. You're going to lose certain things you never had before. There will be a tremendous financial holocaust in America. And what we used to have, we won't have no more. But it doesn't matter, you know, uh, our trust is not in gold and silver or shekels or, or anything of that. And the dollar, our trust is in God. In fact, the currency of heaven is faith. Let me try that again. The currency of heaven is faith. It's not money, not fiat currency. It's nothing this earth can produce. And so I live by faith. Therefore, if I, my faith account is up with God, brother, I can write any check I need at any season of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not worried about the end times. I'm not worried about these days. And uh, again, we'll get into a whole other two hour subject, but uh, you know, you're spot on. That's where we're headed. Uh, accept it, embrace it and let's rock and roll. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm that way. Uh, I have fearless faith and, and I'm like, you know, I don't want destruction. I'm not a son of thunder at all. I don't want to call thunder down and lightning. I don't want to see death in Carters. I'm very sensitive to what that's going to happen, but I'm going to tell you something that it's, it's, it's high time. And, and I think that's where I am in my spirit. Uh, I, I hear the sword is, who has already come out of its sheaf. And I'm going to tell you, the Lord is a warrior and he is going, he's going to clean house y'all. And, and just, you don't want to get in his way. I'll tell you, you don't. Amen. Well, to close it off, you know, um, you say brace yourself, prepare for impact, accept these things. I've, I've thought on it, and there's really five stages people go through. You know, first is even seeing and recognizing what's going on. Second is accepting what is going on. Third is digesting what is going on. Fourth is uh reacting to what's going on whatever choice you've made and then fifth is choosing a lifestyle that's going to facilitate continuation in light of all of these things you know people have to go through this this grieving process like benjamin said to make to make it right within your soul once you've accepted these things you know um and then set your face like flint you know that's a process it's a hard one for people who are you know, sound asleep as well. The Bible does say that the virgins wake up at the midnight hour. So we, we are, that's something I don't want to beat people up who are asleep because the Bible already said they weren't going to wake up until it was all, almost too late. So, you know, for, for anyone who is waking up, you know, I would just encourage you to get on God's fast track program. And it does exist. If you, if you jump into this thing and you, and you ask the Lord for help, to, to know what to do. He will come to your rescue like a mighty warrior, like your best superhero. I've seen it doing for so many besides that as well. You know, our, our ministry, we were called to do more of an acts two thing. We, we consolidated our wealth. You know, my house is 
is uh, being sold as we speak. Uh, you know, we've we've left a lot of things to not only you know build a Goshen, but you know we're going to be opening a church as well. Uh, we're we're a bunch of spirit filled believers that love the Lord, um, and uh, you know we believe in the full gifts of the Spirit, and we see them on a daily basis within our within our group uh, because of that great faith. Um, but I, I will say the greater revelation that I have is that the Lord is going to network all of these Goshens like an apostolic underground railroad, you know, and we're going to have to use technologies like ham radio. We're going to have to receive refugees. We're going to have to send people to certain places because that's the best place for them. We're going to have to heal the sick, cast out demons. We're going to have to get people discipled and feed them. You know, that's, that's the, that's, that's what's next in the American church. And unfortunately, the Laodicean church wants to keep everybody in the pews in their $10 million building. Hmm. And they could have already sold that and gotten five Goshens by now. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm very frustrated with the state of, of things in the church. God will wake them up. But Benjamin, if there's anything, uh, you know, you you would, are, are called to do to, to help expand this network or anything, pray about it and also pray for us and our growth uh, at Stones of Zion. And also, if, if you're called to, to start a Goshen, uh, number one, don't do it out of your own strength. It won't work. Right. The Lord has done everything he's done with us miraculously. Now, it takes it takes some hard hard knock strength to get there. But I'm saying this is not just a rich man gets a bright idea and then wants to wants to be a con artist because there's a lot of people who've done that. You know, um, the Lord wants Acts 2 to happen again, in my opinion. And back in the day, they had to flee Jerusalem. They had to consolidate what wealth they had, and they had to go get homesteads started to survive the persecution of the Roman government. We're headed into the same kind of time. I think I think uh, there will be Goshens all over America and the world in these last days. But if you're called to start one, you you the Lord will not let you do it if you are not humble and if you do not do it with other believers on an equal based ground. The Lord's power and his protection will not be with one man armies in this day. He will He will work through the body of Christ. So this is something that no matter if you're the millionaire and somebody else only has a hundred grand, God doesn't care. He wants to bring us together to with our skills, our anointings and our brotherhood and our sisterhood and for us to be a family. So that's what Goshen is about. But, um, in general, if you're interested in what that looks like, holler, holler at us. But also, if you're where you're at, call your other believers and get this together yesterday. That's how soon you should do that, because we, we don't have much time left to enact, uh, you know, places of refuge for the body of Christ. And if you're wealthy and you hold back your wealth from from uh, the protection and preservation of God's people, wherever that may be. I'm not talking about with us or with Benjamin or or anyone uh, or with Jamie. I know Jamie believes in this stuff too. Steve Quayle does. Uh, you know, we we all love those guys. But if you're a wealthy guy and you wait till the last minute, I do have a word for you that your wealth is going to be stripped from you and your chance to do righteousness with it is going to be taken from you. So if God's convicted you in a wealthy position to help facilitate like a Joseph in Egypt, same principle, to help facilitate the preservation of God's people in this hour, and you do nothing, you're going to be very, very regretful when those dollars are worth nothing and you did not follow your conviction. So I would encourage you to take action um, and, and to help wherever you're called to help, uh, truly. And I think a church building on Main Street is probably not the best place. I think getting these Goshens together is probably a good, probably a good, uh, well spent, uh, you know, thing to do. So, um, you know, Benjamin, any, any thoughts on Goshens and then we'll, we'll close it out. No, other than listen, the perfect will of God is where you need to live. Amen. It don't matter where you are. And, and, uh, so I wouldn't, to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fret. I would just listen to God. If he tells you to be a part of something like that, 
then you obey. Not everybody's called to that. True. I mean, our, our ministry, my main focus is to run into the battle with the sword in my hand and just start whacking. <laughs> uh, that's that's me. I know who I am. And yeah. uh, and, and I'm, I'm called to, to lead a charge that way. But there's also a place you got to go back to. You got to go back to a safe place. And, and I, I vision this, uh, Dalton, is a place like yours to where I, I can you can go there to receive your nourishment and your, your restoration and re-equip, reload, stock back up, and then go back out to the front line, pull some more wounded board people in. And I see that coming in and going out, not camping out and kumbaya with each other. I don't nope. believe that's your intention, nope. but a safe base. Yep. You know, like raiders. I, I don't know. I I just have that, that in my mind, bro. These raiders. We just we go in and raid Alcatraz. You know, or what was the movie about the the city mm. of when, Escape from New York? Amen. Yeah, yeah. I look at it that oh, way, but wow. in a Christ, Christian view, and you know, I just see us going, yeah, you know, like King David, and uh, taking the spoils and coming back to the campfire and showing the foreskins. Yes, come you on, bro. You're firing me up. You're firing <laughs> me up and saying, "Hey, I got one hundred. You know, I got a thousand. You know, and that's how they used to dance. They would dance the movements of how they jabbed and how they killed. And uh, it sounds barbaric, but it was heroic. And we need those men again and women that are heroic. Anyways, we can go start another two hours. But yeah, uh, well, th thank you for bringing that up. We we are definitely not telling anybody to run to the woods in isolation no. and any of that. In fact, I promise you, if you do that, God will take his protection from you first. Cause guess what that is? Selfish. The spirit of selfishness is not, not the name of the game, but yes, just to comment real quick, even kids in our group have had dreams, visions of us going on rescue missions into these cities and pulling out orphans and pulling out single mothers and pulling out families that have been broken or or captured you know i believe that that is the will of god as we go forward so that fires me up you yep. you, you nailed it once again and let's do you it you know thank you for your time benjamin it's it's yeah. an honor uh you know to to hang with you uh we we look up to you and Appreciate and just thank you for uh, coming out as well um in, in any last words you got I love you guys, man. I bless you, my family, all y'all that are listening, watching, that will hear this uh, via his ministry and, of course, our ministry. You know, we're family, and, and let's never forget that. We're not islands or separatists at all. You know, we're revolutionaries together, and we're going to fight the good fight of faith till the king comes and rescues us at that day, and it won't be a day sooner, and it won't be a day longer. It'll be right on time. So we're going to make it. And you're not going to go through this alone. For anybody that's worrying and fearful, don't. We're with you together. And we mean that. I know from my point here, we're as transparent as possible. And, uh, you know, we, we love you whether you're 10,000 miles away from here or you're 10 minutes from here. And, and I know Dalton feels the same and that you have some true voices and true fathers that really care. I can't make excuses for the failures of our of our other fathers and forefathers of, of this generation. But I can tell you there's some real authentic, true men and women of God who love God and love his people. And we'll be here to the very end. Amen. Yes. Uh, whether it be, uh, I'll close with whether it be life or death, yeah. I definitely am determined to protect and preserve the Lord's people in light of what's coming. Um, Absolutely. You know, that's the heart of, 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 a, of a man, I think of every man, not every man has that heart, but I, I think we should all strive to have that heart. You know, we love not our lives into the death. You know, that's one of the themes we have. Yes. But uh, thank you all so much for listening. Yeah. Um, y'all, everybody follow Benjamin that's not, because, you know, if you want to hear the raw, unfiltered uh, truth, that's not just like Alex Jones or news punditry, which it's good to have those things. But Benjamin does it from such a pure place in the Lord. And that's why we love Benjamin. So y'all follow him and uh, much, much blessings, many blessings to each of you. And re may God's revelation and his light shine upon you uh, clearly as to what you should do uh, in this hour. And, and let's all do the Great Commission every single day, 
wherever we're at. In Jesus' name. Love y'all. Peace. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it, my man. Yes. I enjoyed it.